um, which is entitled Rapid, uh, the, the Application of Rapid Ethical Assessment, or REA, to HIV AIDS Research. So Adamu, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, thank you. I'm just confirming because the connectivity from my side is uh, at times uh, affected by the speed of connection here. Uh, but in case if I, I am interrupted, it will come back. So stay there uh, just uh, as, as a note. We'll hang um, in. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe, for the, that uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you also for the opportunity that I got uh, today to, to speak uh, on this uh, webinar topic. Um, um, so I will be taking this topic, uh, which Joe introduced uh, earlier on. Um, as a way of starting, I don't have uh, um, any financial conflicts of interest to, to, de de to declare. Uh, apart from the roles I uh, have uh, at AAU in the uh, ethics committee, which uh, was already mentioned. Uh, and also I would like to mention that this work on rapid ethical assessment was a collaborative work, which we did uh, with a kind of support from Wellcome Trust uh, while I stayed at the Brighton and Sussex Medical School uh, in the UK. So that's where it started and uh, has extended a bit uh, afterwards. Uh, and uh, the issue of uh, linking uh, rapid ethical assessment with HIV AIDS is something which I'm exploring at the moment. So at the end, I will be happy also to get your feedbacks and uh, opinions uh, on, on, on taking the issue uh, a little bit uh, further. And I will be happy uh, if anyone wanted to contact me further for more information or to try the tool in their uh, research uh, uh, projects. Uh, so today I will uh, start with uh, uh, an overview of uh, rapid ethical assessment and then uh, we'll take you to uh, the contextual challenge in, uh, uh, in the consent process uh, in low income settings uh, as a background uh, for uh, or as a justification for uh, uh, this tool, the rapid ethical assessment, which is an approach. Uh, I'll try to illustrate the principles and uh, the last, uh, some examples of taking uh, uh, it uh, in, in implementing, what steps to take in implementing it. And finally, I will uh, uh, talk about possible applications of it in the context of HIV AIDS uh, uh, research. And we'll end with a, a moment of reflection uh, with questions and uh, answers. Uh, uh, so it will be. Uh, session of discussion. Uh, so to start with RA, since this is, a, I mean, the term um, or the phrase rapid ethical assessment is often, uh, uh, I mean, misunderstood uh, by the, the readers. I just wanted to start by mentioning what it is and what it is not. It's not a full description of it, but I just wanted to uh, underline this before going further. Um, so I have uh, had colleagues when they read about this rapid ethical assessment, they, they had different uh, understandings in mind about what this approach uh, would have been. Uh, so I just wanted to say that uh, rapid ethical assessment uh, is not, uh, a pro it's not a, an approach where we expedite the ethics process. I mean, some thought it was uh, taking the review process rapid, uh, but that's not the case. Uh, actually, we, we, we are <clears throat> here considering an additional approach uh, uh, that will help in uh, um, uh, improving the ethical uh, considerations of uh, a research project. So there is actually a little bit of time that it takes uh, uh, in the actual implementation of the research. Uh, otherwise, it will not have any impact on the review process. And it doesn't mean also uh, a rushed type of uh, exercise. The term rapid might mean you know, something you, you rush into, uh, but it is something carefully designed and um, uh, it follows uh, 
principles of uh, um, uh, rapid ethnography uh, with, uh, with a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so it's not it's not like that. Uh, so it's not a rushed substandard or a shortcut to the ethics review process. And the word rapid rather comes from the rapid ethnographic approach, which we uh, uh, tried to uh, explore uh, uh, further. Uh, rather, it is uh, very intense. It takes uh, about <clears throat> four to six weeks, and it's very intense and very practical and is multidisciplinary. It's uh, a teamwork, uh, which uh, I will come to that uh, later on. Uh, but otherwise, compared to classical ethnography, it could be considered uh, um, it's, it's a shorter version, so that's why the term rapid has come from. Um, this was a poster which uh, you know I was presenting this in a conference in uh, in Antwerp uh, in Belgium, and there was a reporter who was making a, like a, um, a picture, uh, a funny picture about all the presentations being presented. He was doing that parallel to the presentations, and this is what he did for my my talk on rapid ethical. Uh, assessment and you, you see a rocket somewhere um, uh, and um, uh, so it might be a little bit of a joke but uh, you can have different co concepts in mind so that's why I just wanted to underline uh, this uh, issues at the beginning. So let's continue to some of the ethical challenges uh, related to informed consent uh, process uh, which led into the the formation of this approach. Uh, I think we all know about uh, uh, informed consent. Informed consent is uh, one of the core research ethics considerations, uh, and it's a way of uh, a, um, ensuring uh, one of the universal uh, ethics principles. Um, and in informed consent, we have both informed provision of information and decision making by the study participants. Uh, these are the two major uh, elements. Um, and uh, yeah, we have fundamental ethical principles that we follow in, uh, in, in research ethics. Uh, and uh, uh, any um, decision related to the, for example, an ethics review or when we have uh, uh, ethical analysis of uh, issues in, uh, uh, in research, in medical research, we pay attention to the, these principles, uh, universal principles, uh, which are related to respecting uh, persons, uh, uh, the balance between benefit and risk and, and justice. Uh, these are further unpacked through uh, regulations and standard standard operating uh, and uh, procedures. Uh, so informed consent uh, goes with the principle of respect for persons uh, or autonomy of persons. Uh, and uh, this is one of the, 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 the cardinal <laughs> principles, so to say, of uh, bioethics. Um, and these principles are considered uh, universal, meaning they apply uh, in any context uh, and in any setting and uh, have to be uh, respected uh, uh, irrespective of uh, contextual differences. Uh, and I think um, this just to mention that informed consent is uh, more than uh, 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 a sheet of paper, uh, it's rather a process. So when we talk about informed consent, there is a whole process of designing an information, communicating the uh, information as per the standard, ensuring um, uh, comprehension, um, and there is a decision-making uh, process. Uh, so informed consent, I mean, even though this is, it's under, understood as, as a paperwork in in most settings, it is rather uh, a continuous process uh, which has different elements uh, in, in its implementation. Another question which 
which might one might stop at is uh, the issue of this universal principles. Uh, so as I said earlier on, uh, the universe, the principles of bioethics are uh, uh, are universal, uh, and researchers in any setting are obliged to to stick to to to, to those. Uh, but the, since the process of informed consent uh, has you know, several steps which could potentially be uh, influenced by contextual uh, variations. One might ask whether the, these principles are really universal. Um, um, and a short answer to that question, I, I don't go to the, the debate here. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, some authors have uh, uh, dealt with this topic, uh, but I think What's important here is, yes, the principles are universal, but application of the principles could be uh, context uh, driven. And so the context could, um, uh, could kind of influence the application. So we can maintain these universal principles, but in applying them, there are several factors in the, in the context that we need to pay uh, attention uh, to. And what are those challenges? Uh, um, so this is a question we already asked, uh, and uh, uh, I will come to this uh, again uh, at the end of the section. Uh, so literature has documented that uh, there are cultural and uh, you know uh, social factors which influence the informed consent process. Um, uh, examples include the way how communities understand science itself, research itself, and the, the research problem uh, under consideration. And um, also the expectations the community has from, from the research, uh, the confusion between treatment and research, the therapeutic mis misconception being uh, one example. Uh, so um, a colleague of uh, ours who do, did um, a qualitative research through, through, through the approach that I'm going to introduce uh, has come to uh, document that the understanding of the community mm. about science and research will have impact on the informed consent process. So uh, his argument was that we need to tailor the consent process to, to the context and, uh, and to, to that effect, we need to take time to understand uh, what the community knows, what the community doesn't know, and what are the cultural and social provisions. Um, there is also, when it comes to decision making, uh, um, uh, again, in the literature, it, was, it has been documented that some communities uh, might have made the decision to involve in the research uh, already ahead of time, uh, irrespective of uh, what information is provided during the informed consent process. Um, so they, they, they are, and it goes to the, the, again, what they might have known uh, ahead of time about the research and uh, they, their previous experiences. And if they thought uh, there is uh, something they they can get from it, uh, even though they don't tell you. They will decide to participate, not because of the level of risk or whatever we have informed uh, them uh, during the informed consent process. Uh, this is a, a paper which uh, I came across uh, uh, a few years ago uh, from the West African perspective. Uh, about a research uh, where there was um, blood collection uh, and the blood was collected and sent for analysis to uh, a European country. And a group of researchers who tried to uh, study the, you know, what the community was thinking about the research came up with this uh, interesting title, which says uh, Doctors and Vampires. So, 
I mean, the, the, in this culture, there was a strong um, thinking that there was a strong attachment towards blood. And if someone is dealing with blood, there's a lot of suspicion behind you know, what's happening to the blood. So where are they taking it? Are they selling it? Or could they be vampires? Um, this was what was uh, um, uh, discussed in, in this particular paper. So when we started the work, we took time to uh, talk to researchers, um, uh, ethics committee members, uh, data collectors uh, from various research in institutes in, the, in Ethiopia, in the country, uh, through structured interviews, but also uh, key informant interviews and focus discussions uh, uh, to register perceived challenges associated with the uh, informed consent process. And um, so this is one of, the, one of the findings from this particular study. Uh, we were told that in the process of uh, designing consent, you know, consent was in most cases designed by the investigator. So the investigator will produce the consent papers um, and that's it. Uh, so this can happen like, you know, the researcher sitting in the office referring to documents, um, but the researcher has never been to, to the village where the research is to be conducted. Uh, in some instances, this consent comes from another country, a uh, collaborating uh, research center and the like. Um, so there were only few uh, instances where there was a proactive uh, step from the research group to, to understand or to take time to learn about the community or to do an assessment ahead of time. Uh, uh, so that's what we, we found. Uh, and some of the common challenges they, they, they reported were um, by researchers who had previous uh, experience of uh, uh, research was that uh, informed consent, uh, uh, like information sheets were not uh, clear enough or inadequacy of information, language barriers. Um, in, the, in the research project I earlier on referred, uh, the one conducted in the, in the South by a colleague of ours, he, he actually wanted to do a, a, a genetic study in the Southern part of Ethiopia in a rural setup. And one of the challenges he had was translating the term genetics and genomics into the local vernacular. So that was, uh, this, this term never existed. So yes, language is often a challenge. And sometimes uh, even in a, within a same language group, there could be different dialects and uh, a word which we thought would be understood by a certain group might have a different uh, dialectical meaning. Uh, so cultural differences, which include uh, power, power issues, gender dynamics. There are setups where uh, decisions are made by the elderly or um, men of the household, uh, even though they are not the study participants. Uh, so these are some cultural uh, uh, framework. Um, um, and expectations, power imbalance, yeah, so the, were also some of the, the points we, we got from this uh, uh, assessment. And uh, um, I think I mentioned about language uh, and the, the aware, whatever awareness the community has about research, health, medicine, uh, medical interventions also will, uh, will affect uh, the, the informed consent uh, process. We have talked about expectations and participants making decisions ahead of time uh, without the, the, the information that we provide them. Um, there is also the, a focus more on the consent uh, part. This, this was actually um, a, t a tendency uh, registered uh, as a common problem from the the researchers uh, angle that they, they focus more on the decision 
in the signature they give than taking time to explain, answer questions, you know, and dwell uh, on, on that element, which was actually rather the most important part. Um, and the undue emphasis on um, the rules and procedures. This was actually a critic into the, the review process and the informed consent process. So uh, in the, I mean, in the review process, we have standards to follow uh, for the consent uh, to, to, to agree to the standards, uh, while the actual implementation may not be, may not be so. So these are some quotes which I may not go go read uh, all of them. Maybe I will read a few of them. Um, uh, so wow, someone said, I mean, in a country where you where you have uh, lots of lang language, uh, uh, like Ethiopia, where we have uh, eighty ethnic groups, and uh, um, each of the ethnic groups have uh, a language of their own. Um, so translation and making sure that all versions are understood, especially if you have multi-center studies within, uh, within the country is, is a challenge. And so this, this one said, when we come to information, there is a problem of language. It is a diverse country. So even when you translate to Amharic is a, the national working language, um, it's hard to bring the understanding. It's hard to translate scientific words to, to, to Amharic. Um, this, uh, this is about lack of awareness about research in the else. Um, the society might be where they have no knowledge about research. And, you know, people might have not understood what's written if they can't read. Uh, so these are some loopholes. So especially rural studies where uh, in the rural areas, not everyone is educated, not everyone can uh, read and write. That's also another, another uh, problem into the, the informed consent process. I'll just skip the other, the other quotes. Uh, I, I think for the interest of time, I will skip uh, the quotes since we have already talked about uh, the issues. And we also asked this stakeholders about their suggestions to improve the consent process. And uh, so one of the, the suggestions was involving uh, the, the, the community or, or the potential study participants in it. Uh, meaning we need to uh, have a way of knowing the community and having the, 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 their say. They also talked about training, especially for researchers and uh, 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 data collectors so that they, they are very sensitive to the, the, the needs of the community. A differentiated approach, again, since there are contextual differences all across, they, they suggested to pay attention to uh, contextual uh, differences. Uh, a pre-assessment in a way of addressing community needs was suggested, uh, including field visits uh, before and after uh, before initiation of the study, but also afterwards as a follow-up. Uh, um, and I mean, the last one is not related only to informed consent process, but it was a concern from the research the researchers, especially that uh, ethics review uh, should rather promote research. And uh, they were um, saying that we shouldn't be legalistic, but we need to be flexible enough to to promote uh, and accommodate for needs as needed. Um, so that was uh, the assessment we did. We also did a literature review uh, uh, to try to identify um, the factors that uh, will influence uh, the consent uh, process. And as you can see from this uh, framework, so the, so the consent process can be influenced by several factors, including contextual and cultural issues, including uh, uh, language. So just to summarize, uh, um, so we have universal principles, but we have diverse contexts. And 
So as as uh, as researchers, we need to strike the right balance uh, over over there. So some of the challenges include research awareness, therapeutic misconception, language, uh, decision dynamics, uh, focusing on uh, consent than the comprehensive uh, informed consent process. Um, another challenge, especially in uh, in most low uh, resource settings, was uh, the the community versus uh, the individual. Um, and I think in the in the Western uh, perspective, the individual the, the autonomy of the individual is very clear. But in uh, in our setting, the individual is within the community, uh, and autonomy cannot be detached from from that reality. Uh, we have lots of gender dynamics. Uh, we have done one assessment in the in the rural area where we we had uh, asked about this, and we had diverse uh, responses uh, depending on who the respondents were. Uh, men had a different. Uh, response than, 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 than women about who should uh, give consent for uh, uh, for or on behalf of uh, uh, a woman's study participant. Um, and comprehension, which is, this is something which usually uh, uh, overlook and even in the ethics committee uh, discussions, comprehension doesn't usually come to, come to the discussion, but that's very important. If you misunderstood uh, the information in the informed consent form, you could make a decision based on uh, a different assumption. Uh, so, what are the implications? Uh, so, the implications are then, yeah, we have universal principles and uh, uh, contextual realities. We need to reconcile those. Uh, and then the next question will be how? So then I will talk about the rapid ethical assessment, which, uh, uh, which tries to bridge uh, this, this gap. So rapid ethical assessment is rather an approach uh, which is developed to improve a co context tailored application of the informed uh, consent process. Uh, so as I said earlier on, this is an approach borrowed from the ethnographic uh, research techniques. Uh, so even though, you know, in a classical ethnographic research, you go to a community, you live the, there for uh, several years. But in a rapid ethnography, this is a version where uh, you will have quick results uh, and you will have an intense um, way of compensating for, for that. Uh, whereby you have multidisciplinary team uh, uh, which uh, interacts all throughout all throughout the, the, the starting from the very uh, beginning uh, stays together uh, builds a very good group rapport um, and by the end of that period of four to six weeks has a very good understanding of that community uh, towards this research, uh, inform, uh, rather informed consent related issues and factors. And the approach can be uh, uh, flexible enough to accommodate for uh, issues, um, pre-identified issues, emerging issues, and issues to be followed up afterwards. So we also employ a mix of methods, qualitative uh, methods, including interviews, observations, and uh, focus discussions. Um, um, and this actually, the work goes back to uh, uh, earlier to, towards 2005, where um, Susan Bull, the one on the left side, uh, under the supervision of uh, Bobby Farsides, the one on the right, who later on also appeared to be my PhD, promoter, uh, they took this approach in, uh, in, in the Gambia and uh, tried it in a, 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 a TB trial. Um, and um, so Susie's conclusion was that this approach 
is something we need to further uh, take up uh, and recommend it for use by researchers, the, the researchers themselves. So she went as a social scientist and went into the research projects of other researchers. And she said, uh, we need to help researchers do it. And uh, uh, Fasil Takola in 2009, he was a researcher himself and took the approach and uh, uh, did the assessment in, uh, in Southern Ethiopia for a genetic study on podoconiosis, which I earlier on mentioned. And uh, he, he has published those two papers on uh, the experiences he had. So from the, the, the two groups, uh, it was evident that the approach is uh, useful and we need to possibly scale up. But we, we didn't know uh, to what extent the approach can be used and uh, uh, its feasibility and clarity of guidance for, for its use. And that was actually uh, the gap which I tried to fill when I did my, my uh, uh, doctoral uh, study. Uh, this was a topic which Joe mentioned earlier on. Uh, so I, I tried to uh, establish the need for the approach, its feasibility, and provide some, some guidance. And I had three phases uh, for it uh, to address these uh, three areas. Um, um, and we piloted the approach into uh, three different projects in five uh, locations in the in the country uh, and tried to document uh, the feasibility and cost uh, costing analysis of the approach as well and uh, we published uh, on those so I will not go to the details of what we did uh, but these were the settings where we tried to go to different uh, settings as diverse as possible in the in the country um, um, maybe this is important. The approach we followed was, the steps we followed was starting from the very decision of whether we need rapid ethical assessment in, in the particular study. We approached uh, principal investigators of other studies. We talked to them. We had discussion about what ethical issues might uh, emerge and so on. So we, we came to a joint decision if we needed it or not. And this is also later on incorporated into the guideline, what issues to take into consideration when you make uh, uh, this decision. And the next step is the planning of the rapid ethical assessment. That's very vital, uh, very important. Uh, and it in this includes identification of members of the, the team. It's supposed to be a multidisciplinary team, which includes the, the principal investigator, a social scientist, uh, but also an insider uh, of the setting. Uh, so that's the minimum uh, number we need. But as needed also we involve it uh, one or two. So usually the members range it between uh, four to five. Uh, so careful preparation was done and then moving to the field, uh, then the data collection and the analysis. And the analysis will have both on the field analysis uh, with the daily debriefings, which will inform subsequent data collection. Uh, and uh, that was actually uh, what we used for um, the, for, uh, as an input for improving the informed consent process in the different research uh, projects. And we also did uh, advanced uh, like analysis with uh, coding and uh, uh, we published uh, uh, based on that. Um, so these are some pictures. Uh, so we just talked about the two levels of analysis. Um, and examples of major ethical issues we, we came to know included uh, issues related to the research, but also issue, issues not directly related to the research, but are related to the, the, the settings and the, in the different uh, communities. Um, uh, issues around you know, stigma, taboo, um, who are the decision makers uh, or so-called gatekeepers, uh, expressions and terminology, 
uh, preferences on decision making, uh, gender dynamics, um, uh, an issue of signature. I mean, we have had interesting uh, uh, discussions around uh, around signatures. So, um, so the, the the end of the end result of all this was informing. You know, based on whatever has come, we sit with the PIs. Uh, and we discuss about how to accommodate this in the consent uh, uh, process. So it includes on the content of the, 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 the information sheet, the language, uh, and also we plan for um, better ways of you know, communicating and also decision making and documenting uh, that. These are some of the papers which came out of uh, that exercise. Uh, also, um, we tried also to pilot this in uh, in other research after I concluded mine. Uh, so some publications have come out afterwards. So in a way of following this up, also I, whenever possible, I have been trying to promote this with uh, with the projects I have. Uh, we we got a small grant with from the WHO to 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 pilot this in a. Uh, uh, an NTD uh, uh, research uh, project in Ethiopia. We haven't yet published mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, we also tried it in a, in a cancer uh, research, a longitudinal uh, uh, cohort we have in, in Addis. Uh, and uh, so one of our PhD students has actually used this approach in, uh, in tailoring the, the consent form he used for this uh, participants and he has uh, published that out. We have, I'm also now working with a Neurogap uh, project. Uh, I'm a member of the ethics uh, working group and we have tried to initiate the research projects uh, together with a group in Oxford and uh, I am I'm taking the rapid ethical assessment to, uh, to evaluate the informed consent process and uh, Tailor accordingly, um, and that's uh, on progress at the moment. We have had a discussion with uh, Mycetoma Research in, in Khartoum, uh, but it didn't somehow happen, and I hope it will it will continue. Uh, this will continue soon. Finally, before I conclude, um, I just wanted to uh, mention talk about HIV AIDS, how, how versus rapid ethical assessment. Uh, so the questions are, um, so will R RA be useful in uh, HIV AIDS research? So this is a question which I'm working on at the moment and I'm very happy to, to get feedback from, from you at the end as well. And what issues to take into consideration uh, if, if so. And in the in the document, uh, in one of the, the, the I mean, the, the report which I which I wrote uh, towards the, the end of uh, the, the study was uh, a, a guideline for rapid ethical uh, assessment, its application, and uh, the decision whether to take RA or not depends on several considerations, and one was the type of research. So it doesn't mean we need to do RA for all types of research, but should be a research uh, project where we will have uh, um, an added value from um, uh, employing an RA. Uh, so, so when applying HIV AIDS, when, when taking HIV AIDS research into consideration, so um, these are a list of uh, things which we might to need to uh, uh, check against. So I, I took uh, three of those sensitivity of issues, vulnerability, and intervention. Um, uh, and try to see in the literature what, 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 what's uh, written, what's published about HIV AIDS research uh, on those uh, uh, criteria. And uh, so in the literature, we, we see that HIV AIDS research is, is, um, is acknowledged for its sensitivity and study participants are uh, vulnerable. And uh, there are several interventional studies 
Um, currently, I think still there are antiretroviral trials, maybe a few of them going on, but not as, uh, as was uh, a decade ago. But we have several uh, prevention trials, vaccines and microbicides especially. Um, so I thought, so th those are uh, some considerations uh, on the table. Uh, in this particular reference, uh, uh, a paper from South Africa, um, so the, the author <laughs> have said that in the South African context where there are uh, several of those intervention trials uh, going on, uh, they, they acknowledge the importance of context and uh, the need for addressing contextual factors, which RA is uh, supposed, to, supposed to do. And when it comes to vulnerability, again, uh, there are uh, different types of vulnerability, of course, uh, and it's a whole talk by itself. Uh, but uh, uh, HIV AIDS research participants are from a setting where there are several layers of vulnerability. And there needs to be uh, clear guidelines on how to address those. And this will include understanding what, what actually is happening and uh, uh, RA will possibly be uh, a tool to, to do that. Uh, in this guideline from UNHCR and uh, WHO again, uh, the same facts are uh, reiterated. Um, uh, the issue of vulnerability is already uh, uh, talked, I have talked about that. And uh, so this document tries to align vulnerability with, with, with context as well and uh, calls for approaches that address uh, this challenge. Um, also talks about uh, special groups and like women uh, and gender dynamics. And finally, they talk a lot about the need for monitoring and maintaining standard in the informed consent process in HIV AIDS uh, research. And uh, I believed RA would be an approach for uh, addressing, so I'll just uh, skip those uh, uh, text. Uh, but I, we also thought over the years that RA might have other applications as well. Um, um, not only in research, but informed consent in medical intervention, in clinical care, and also in implementation research. Uh, and of course, the, the challenge of uh, RA would be that, you know, it's multidisciplinary. So you need to work with other disciplines and it requires you to go uh, an extra mile. So it's an additional work for the researchers and you need to have uh, clear uh, uh, guidelines. So the concluding remark will be that um, for the question whether RA will be the right way of addressing HIV AIDS research, yes, depends, depending on the type of research and we need to pay attention to the key considerations and uh, key steps uh, there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm sorry that I took a few extra minutes. So I will turn you back to Joe for uh, feedback and for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Adamu, very much. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, and no, no problem with taking a few extra minutes. I think everyone uh, found it to be beneficial. So uh, I'll Thank just you. maybe um, remind everyone that you can uh, post questions or comments to the chat box. Um, if you post them to everyone, we'll be able to see them and I'll, I'll raise them for for discussion uh, and comment from Bayadamu or others. Um, and you may also, if you wish, just um, hover over your name in the participant list or go down to the bottom left corner of your screen and hover there and you'll see the mute icon and you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question verbally. Um, but maybe while, while individuals are, are doing that, um, I might just ask you a, a couple of questions or, um, and just see what your thoughts are. Please. So I'm. I, I, um, I certainly, I think many people would appreciate the, um, the focus of using REA for, um, for application to consent and consent issues. And, um, and so I guess I, I, and I see the value there. It feels like a natural place for rapid ethical assessment. 
But I wonder if, building on maybe one of your last slides there, do you see REA as um, potentially being a method that could be used for understanding other aspects of um, research or practice? Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, maybe understanding better the ethical aspects of dissemination of research information or data after the study's over or better understanding uh, and optimizing engagement practice with practices with communities more generally or other other types of things about um, you know maybe even the effic efficacy or um, best practices for administering uh, study interventions within the context of particular communities so anyway curious to what extent maybe you, you've thought about that and what some of the limitations might be, or yeah. thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I th I think in, in principle um, it's possible that this approach can be used for um, <clears throat> better underst understanding of contexts where we want to not only do research and uh, uh, recruitment, which which is a focus. Here, I haven't personally tried that, or uh, you know, this did this uh, implementation of RA on uh, mm -hmm. on other aspects. But mm -hmm. in principle, and that's also the feedback I I have received when uh, when I talked with uh, experts in in different places that maybe we can potentially explore the role of this approach in in taking new interventions to new communities, for example. So mm -hmm. uh, and so. Uh, and also someone also mentioned about, for example, in Europe, um, because of the new uh, refugee issues, there are new new communities uh, living in, in the European setting. This could be an yeah. approach where, you know, like the researchers or the medical community take to understand the new community who has just arrived. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the options are there, I, I believe. Yeah. Let me um, let me unmute um, Mark Hubbard on here. It looks like he might have a question. Uh, Mark, did you have a, a question or comment? Yes, I sure do. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. So one thing that yes, I would sir. point out is um, where we uh, where you discuss the UNH document on ethical guidelines and so forth. I would point out that there is a UNH document on good participatory practice. And it's interesting because it's the first I've heard of your concept. I think it's very useful. Um, and I think it fits well within GPP, which is kind of the same thing at a macro level, uh, and particularly to the degree that it brings ethnography to the table. Um, I mostly have worked with the large networks who are dealing with a lot of these issues on an ongoing basis in HIV prevention research, as well as uh, looking forward to things uh, that are bridging over into HIV treatment and cure types of research. And then the moderator said something about dissemination, and GPP really provides a framework for that. And I would also say another um, thorny issue that this approach might be really good uh, for is determining the standard of care, which has become a very sticky wicket in HIV uh, prevention research trials. So in other words, um, how do we deal with the conflict between being able to find uh, an efficacy signal with the ethical obligation to provide best practice in terms of prevention when we have highly effective chemoprophylaxis and things like that? So don't know if that's eliciting a comment, but it seems like it dovetails nicely and might fit a special uh, might play a special role in GPP, which is by its nature multidisciplinary, multimodal in terms of all it, combining lots of approaches to protect consumers or participants. That's a great point. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a good uh, supplement. I, I I'll look at the, the document you recommended and uh, so I, I, I'm still developing this, uh, the way how we would employ RA into HIV AIDS research. So. Thank you for that remark. Thank you. Yeah, it certainly seems like as a method, um, you know, supplementing those guidance documents with a, an approach or method for contextualizing and tailoring um, those those kinds of things is it would be fantastic. And it yeah. seems like others are working on that as well. But that um, that there may be some lessons learned here that could be transferred over. Um, I see there's another 
uh, comment in the chat box here. Um, someone has posted a, a comment saying, I was intrigued on one of your early slides by the fact that in many cultures, consent for genetic studies needs to be given at the level of the family. And this seems to be a great idea to me. And it made me wonder if REA could also be used in our own Western cultures for new types of research, such as genetics and biobanking. So, um, I, and I also noted, I think you said, uh, maybe the method was used also in Cameroon, but yeah, do you think it might be of potential utility uh, outside low and middle income country context for some of these um, sort of sticky uh, issues and questions? Yeah, yes. So I think whenever we have this, uh, this uh, interaction between this, a new concept or a new emerging, uh, newly emerging idea, like genetics is, is, is new, I mean, for, especially for the African setting. But genetics has also brought a, a new paradigm of uh, understanding uh, testing, return of sample, and the implication it has on the family, as you rightly mentioned, is something we don't know how to handle. So I, I again, in principle, I do agree that this is uh, uh, a possibility. And thank you for the remark. So, so um, maybe another question for you, Damu. I'm. Um, I'm wondering if you can, apologies if you mentioned, but um, in the context of your own studies and work, um, can you give a, an estimate of sort of how long from start to finish, um, the sort of rapid, how rapid is the rapid ethical assessment? Uh, how much time does it take? How many sort of members, how big is the team? What kinds of members uh, would ideally comprise that team in terms of expertise? Um, maybe if you could say a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah. yeah no, yes. Sorry. Thank, thank I have already you. mentioned it. <laughs> thank you, John. No, no problem. Yeah. I was uh, a little rushing uh, on that yeah. stage. So I think the the um, the time is uh, on average four to six weeks. Mm. Uh, as, and in one of uh, my studies, it has taken me seven weeks. So that is the maximum. Mm. Um, uh, so depending on the issue, the logistical provisions and uh, how soon you arrive to a level of saturation, uh, so the, the duration might might vary. But it's good to plan for six weeks. Mm. And the the RA team is actually the key, the key there uh, establishing an RA team, uh, and the team dynamics is very important. I like as in any rapid ethnographic process. Um, and so we, we can have four to five members. Uh, it's good to have the researcher uh, as a member, the researcher, the PI of the end. We need to have a social scientist. Uh, if the researcher himself is not a social scientist, uh, preferably an anthropologist. Um, and the the researcher would be subject matter expert uh, over there. And we also, I mean, since the team is coming as an outsider, we need to have an insider. So someone from the, the local area. So who will stay with the team? I will join the team and will stay with, with the team as well. Um, so depending on who is the PI and uh, the role of the PI and the discipline the, the PI uh, will have, we'll have about four to five members. In our case, we, we, we went into the research projects of others. So we, we mostly, it was about four, five members, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it could also be four members uh, if, if that's not the case. Okay. And uh, it, so it is time intensive and uh, there is also a little bit of resource uh, to be planned for. Yeah. yeah. And then in terms of outputs from, from the process, um, I assume you're trying to develop something that's very practical for the, for the research team. Is that right? In, yes. In, so, yeah. So the final output is, goes into two aspects about the content and the delivery of the informed consent. 
So what, what to take into consideration in the, in the content, for example, the terminologies used, uh, the descriptions uh, used as, as, as an example, and the decision dynamics. So uh, like when they make the decision, how do we, uh, um, <laughs> I mentioned about signature, which we assume like in, a, in most setups, signatures will be welcome, but we have come to know that signature might be misunderstood easily by the community. So again, we need to come up with creative ways of documenting the consent, uh, valid consent, but uh, you know, relevant to the context as well. So it will be feeding back to the study team on these two areas. Great. All right, well, um, I hate to cut it short. I'm sure we could talk for many more um, minutes, if not hours, but um, let's just thank uh, our guest today, our speaker, uh, Adamu Adesia, and, um, and thank you all for joining. Um, as I mentioned earlier, thank we you. will circulate the audio recording, and with your permission, Adamu, also maybe a copy of your slides. Yes, no problem. Um, no problem. And then we can uh, then share it uh, with other colleagues. So thanks again, everyone. Um, and we look forward to hopefully your participation in future webinars. Thank you. Thank you all.